Hi, I'm Mary Scotton, and I had the privilege of inviting Sharice Hawkins here today to share her story. And I'm super excited uh, about the whole Luminary Developer Track, and especially this session. Uh, we did a dry run together. I learned a lot. And so I think it's going to be uh, pretty amazing. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Sharice before she kicks off. So she's a CEO and co-founder of Beneath the Ink, which is actually a really cool product. Thank you. And she's an engineer who started her career as a Walt Disney Imagineer and eventually served as a VP at Time Warner Cable. So she's applied two decades of corporate experience to the launch of her own tech startup in 2012. She's going to tell you a little bit about that. And she's now the CEO and co-founder of Beneath the Inc., a software company providing tools for interactive digital content creation. Sharice brings expertise in product development, managing high-tech teams, and developing innovative products to client projects around the globe. And today she's going to share with you six things she wished she'd known about people, profit, and product before she started that company. Come on up, Sharice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. I'm going to share with you these six things that have had a really big impact on my life. And I think they will be impactful for you as well. As uh, Mary mentioned, I've had a kind of a, a very uh, interesting path to be here today. And I've noticed that these six things have had such a big impact that I wish when I was the, the person you see here today who's the entrepreneur, I wish I'd had the opportunity to tell my former self, my corporate self, some of these things when she was just starting out. So as Mary mentioned, I have had a very interesting career in the sense that my, my first job was as a Walt Disney Imagineer, where I designed theme parks and shows around the globe. And my most recent position was VP of Software Development at Time Warner Cable, leading large development teams. But now I'm in a completely new role I've never done before. I'm CEO and an entrepreneur in Boulder, Colorado. Now, the six things I'm going to share with you are not in a particular order, because I think that would do both you and me a disservice. They're, they're really concepts that orbit around the things that are the most impactful and uh, engaging as when, you're, when you're actually working on a new product. So bear with me. We're going to go through them and, and get through all of them. But they're not kind of in, in ranked order by any means. Now, the most impactful thing that you can do when, you, when you're a small business or even a large business is what's on the bottom of this slide. You create something new, you share it with a complete stranger, and they decide to actually purchase it. I can't wait to hear what Mark is going to, to share today in his keynote. But I noticed that when we were going through this process, that the things I'm going to tell you about people, profit, and product were always present as our company grew and became more successful. It wasn't easy to create page dip, what you see here on the screen. But these six, six things were uh, clear um, indicators that we were on the right track. I'm going to make two asks of you. I know it's a little early in the morning, but I, you can do this. The first is to actually suspend your preconceived notions about what a breakout session like this should be. Because I think the word should doesn't usually serve us very well. The second thing is for you to be willing to join me on an experiment, a very short one. Now, this experiment has three criteria. The first is for you to adopt, even temporarily, a preference for engaging with someone that you don't already know, maybe, or maybe someone that you've met for less than 24 hours. The second thing is I want you to imagine that you are in an important business uh, situation. Maybe you're interviewing for a new position in your company. Maybe you're talking to a very important client. Or maybe you're at an amazing Dreamforce conference. This is my first one, and I'm still overwhelmed. Um, and this whole thing will only take seven seconds. Now, what I want you to do is a task that we're very familiar with. It's simply shaking hands. We do this um, all the time in our business lives. Um, but I want us to notice something when you shake hands. So I'm going to ask you to take the seven-second experiment. I want everyone to stand up if you're comfortable. I want you to turn to someone that you don't know and just shake hands and say hello or nice to meet you. 
<laughs> Excellent. All right. You did great. You can all sit back down now. I'm actually thrilled that this early in the morning conversations were sparked that easily. Congratulations. Now what I want you to notice, and we're going to come back to this, is if instead of your hand that person had grasped, say, a cell phone, would it have remained in their hand or would it have fallen to the floor? Just notice. I also want to congratulate you because you've done the very first thing you've been introduced to something that I wish I'd known before, and that's get to know people you don't know. Now, this is me in the upper right-hand corner, and that's my former self, Avatar. Um, and this is what she would say if I had told her this, um, that I'm an introvert, and I hate networking, and it's exhausting. And I would nod empathetically because I am still an introvert, and I still find networking exhausting at times. But it's so critical, it's so important. So I'll, I'll tell her and I'll tell you a story. Starting a company is a very, very big decision. And deciding who to start that company with is probably an even bigger decision. I started my company with a person I did not know at all. He was a complete stranger. I remember it was 2012 and I was sitting in the Denver airport across from this person, his name is Alex, and we had met four times for maybe a total of four hours. We were heading to Australia to do a 13-week startup accelerator. Now you might think, this woman is crazy. Who would do something like that? Um, it all worked out well. Um, we ended up becoming co-founders and starting Beneath the Ink. Um, but it was that first willingness to talk to a stranger. Now granted, someone that we both knew and trusted had introduced us, but we were able and willing to make that very first awkward conversation and meet each other. Seven months later, we are sitting at an award banquet where our very first project won Best Interactive Ebook in New York City. The woman who's sitting between us is the author that we worked with on that project, and we had only met her two times before we agreed to do that project. So meeting strangers can really change your life. But what are some strategies that you can take away that will help you with this concept? I've listed a few here. The first is give yourself a, a short period of time where you can try this, just five minutes. When you go into a new situation, give yourself five minutes to um, push outside your comfort zone and meet new people. I like to set goals. How many business cards can I collect? Can I find the person who's traveled the furthest to this event? Just making it fun. You might compete with one of your colleagues or a friend on some of those other things. How many business cards can they collect? Um, and I, I will tell you that practice makes this much easier and much more natural over time. So if at first it feels a little bit uncomfortable, pretty soon um, this will feel a lot more natural for you. And one of my favorite tricks is to reward myself for doing things I'm not comfortable with. And in the case of um, meeting new people and getting business cards, for every business card I would acquire, I would allow myself to have one of those Hershey nuggets, you know those little chocolates? It made a very big difference in my motivation. The next thing that I want to tell you about, not quite as fun, um, it's about making mistakes. And that some mistakes are good, especially when you are in a, a mode of extreme striving. Here's the reaction that my former self would, would give you. She was a perfectionist to the utmost degree, taking very small and careful steps towards things, uh, being slightly risk averse, even for some large um, projects that she was working on or some success, successes that she'd had in her career, still a little bit cautious and um, obviously perfectionist. And don't get me started about if making the smallest error, how much I would beat myself up for something not going right. But you really don't know what you're capable of if you can't push yourself to, to your limits. And if you push yourself to your limits, sooner or later, at some point or another, you're likely to make a mistake. We ended up, or I ended up, having one of my biggest mistakes be in front of millions of people, literally. This is Alex and I on Shark Tank. We, um, our company was going pretty well at this point. We just won that award I told you about, another book had won another award. We were feeling pretty confident about our direction. And we were certainly striving to make it happen. Uh, 
we failed in front of millions of people. The Sharks hated our idea. We did not get funding. We were the only company on, the show, on that episode to not get funding. Spoiler alert, don't need to go look it up. We don't get funding. <laughs> and I forgot one of my lines. And imagine this, this particular failure was rerun multiple times over the next two years. Yeah, um, but we learned a lot. And we were definitely striving. And we said, if this project or product isn't going to go, it won't be because of our lack of trying. And so we put every waking hour and all of our energy into making it be the best that it could be. And the sharks told us, you have a, you have, your product is really interesting. Um, Robert, in particular, was, was, was excited about it. Um, they said, but you have worked so hard on the product that you haven't thought that much about the profit. And you're not meeting your, your goals there. Luckily, it was an easy problem to solve because by selling to the right people, to the right audience, moving from t traditional publishers to business people and a B2B enterprise solution, we started making money. So people were the key. And what I learned from this experience is by failing early, it actually allowed our company to survive. So what are some strategies that you can do around making mistakes and taking these risks? First of all, consider the upside. Think about where you want to go and what, what's the possible positive outcome from what's going to happen, and not the pitfalls and places that you might stumble a bit, little bit. I read an article that 85% of what we worry about doesn't happen, 85%. Also, give yourself permission to try. Just being in that mindset, I've, I'm going to give it my all and I'm gonna see what happens. Limit how long you're willing to dwell on things that don't go right. You learn from it and you move on. And the other thing you can do is write it down. What are, the, what are your goals for um, taking this new opportunity and what do you hope to, to gain from them? It's just really nice to do that and then maybe go back and, and look at it later. So here's the third thing I wish I'd known. To practice earning freestyle um, points which may seem, uh, as, as it did to me, I wasn't sure what that meant. Was it, were you talking about swimming and Olympics? You know, what, what is a freestyle? Freestyle is taking an opportunity to do something completely different, giving yourself the permission and the space to try some different things or work with different people, and to not have expectations about what the outcome will look like. Freestyle actually changed the direction of our company and is a great way to reinvigorate your product development cycle. And you're also probably more needed the most when you're most loath to, to try something like this because you've got deadlines and, and, and things to do. This is a mock-up that we did of where we wanted our company to go directionally. We worked with uh, one of our mentors who's you know, famous for working on some, some big movies and The Matrix, for example. And we came up with this concept of what we thought the intersection of media and text could be in the future. Um, we don't have holograms yet, but it really allowed us to open our minds and be able to do some interesting freestyle sprints um, to get there. And the number one product that we sell today came out of a freestyle sprint. It wasn't our main trajectory. It was something that we were just attempting to do and experimenting with. So it can be incredibly powerful. What we did come up with was the ability to integrate panoramic images into words and text. So this is an example of our page step there. Um, we would have never gotten to this place if we hadn't taken a freestyle timeout. So what are some strategies that you can use to put this into practice? There's a few of them. First of all, set aside some time to create a freestyle. How many of you ever heard of freestyle sprints? Oh, great, okay. Um, set aside some time to do that. And it works best when an entire organization or entire group can go through a freestyle experience together. So if half of you are working on um, business as usual and deadlines and, and the structure, and the other half are in this creative mode, it doesn't necessarily work as well. So for us, we found that um, 10 days is the perfect amount of time for us to be able to do a freestyle. The second thing is, don't skip the retrospective. That's where really all of the, the good learnings come from. So I would say if you don't have the opportunity to do a retrospective and reflect on what happened, then don't start at all. 
because being able to talk about who did you, what did, what did you find out, what did you learn, who did you work with, or there's some ideas for products that came from two different groups, or a solution that um, was really synergistic between two, you know, two different organizations. That's where the magic happens. And then think about, there's often opportunities that you would like to pursue, but you can't for resource constraints, budget constraints, time constraints. Um, so you're not able to move you know, in the full capacity towards this new objective. But I challenge you to think about if you can't do the whole piece, um, if those, if those uh, constraints were removed, what could you do? What's the next step? So by thinking about the step after the, the next one, sometimes you can come up with some solutions that really allow you to, to move forward anyway. Maybe there's another uh, a path around an obstacle, or maybe there is something smaller that you can, you can take advantage of if you're thinking about where you want to head. Here's the fourth thing that I wish I'd known earlier, and that's how to save the sand in your hourglass. We have a really interesting relationship with time, and if I was talking to my former self, she'd probably be walking to a meeting while eating and rushing and not even hearing what I'm talking about. Um, my life was that hectic, and, I, and some of us are in situations where you know, you're, you're double booked all day, for example. Um, but we don't really take the time to think about our relationship with time. We actually had some interesting things happen when we started our company. And I started to observe how we held meetings and how we dealt with time as a small group and continued to apply those as we got larger. So how many of you do uh, stand-up meetings or agile? Um, yeah. And you stand up, right? That's what they're called, stand-up meetings. We had stand-up meetings for our scrum uh, every day. We also had stand-up meetings for sales and marketing calls, troubleshooting, sometimes code reviews. Um, all, most of our meetings were standing up. And it could have been because we weren't a very big company and we didn't have a plush, large conference room and table and, and, and leather chairs. But I like to think that it was more to do with the urgency that we felt around getting our product to market and having the right people at the right time working on that. Now, one of our favorite clients says, uh, you have, we always end our meetings early. It's, it's something that, that always seems to happen with, no matter how, you know, how long the, the time is allocated. And I said, I'm giving you back the gift of time. And there's no reason if a meeting is supposed to end at 10 o'clock, there's nothing magical about the top of the hour. If we're done at 8.47, we just adjourn. It's so liberating. So what are, some, what are some strategies that you can do to save the, the sand in your hourglass? You can set goals and time limits for your meetings. It's amazing how many people don't do this. You can also think about what is the culture, what are the norms that are around your organization for people that are tardy and for um, your, your relationship with time in general. I cannot stress enough how important it is to have, give people a heads up and have pre-meetings, particularly around um, large topics or where you're trying to get consensus. You'll find out who's an ally. You might be able to ask people for, for their support. You'll get a lot more information than putting people on the spot in one big group um, trying to, to ratify um, a new solution or get support for an idea that you might have. Just go and talk to them ahead of time. Just catch them in the hallway. It's really quite easy to do and people appreciate it. Something I didn't know was so powerful and, and easy to do when I was in corporate. Consider having more standing meetings. It doesn't have to just be for Scrum. Or having meetings in a less common location, outside or in a different, a different environment, just to shake things up and also not be so aware of the clock that's hanging on the wall. Then something else I noticed and Salesforce obviously does a great job with this, we don't give ourselves time for passing periods like we did in high school or college. You've got the ability to schedule things right up, you know, up next to each other. And that makes everyone feel very anxious and uncomfortable. So give some time to actually move from place to place. Have people be there settled and ready to work. Now, here's the fifth thing I wish I'd known. Looks don't count when it comes to teamwork. My former self would say, but doesn't everyone have unconscious bias? Of course we do. I do. Everyone does. It's interesting to me that this is a fantastic team, but our business isn't necessarily a Peloton. We don't all look alike. I, I struggle. I think they might have different 
sunglasses on. Um, and if your team looks like this, or they look this homogeneous, then that's not, that's not a good indicator of how, how powerful and how constructive they can be as a group. When Alex, and Alex is six foot tall, he's blonde, and he's a, he's a semi-professional break dancer that can spin on his head. And then you know what I look like. So when we would go to lunch, people would often, you know, we'd go to some place like Noodles. I don't know if you have Noodles out here. They give you numbers when you order. They would actually give us different numbers and just assume there was no way possible that we would be going or having a conversation or be connected to each other. Um, so we are very different. Our backgrounds, our, our degrees that we got in school, how quickly we, we speak, what we look like, um, it just goes on and on and on. But it was an incredibly powerful business relationship. And we noticed how much more we were able to accomplish um, by having these different perspectives and being able to collaborate and work together. This is what our team looked like um, a year in. There were people that were shorter than me, <laughs> um, younger than Alex. There were people that uh, had many more years of experience, um, different ages, different genders. Um, one person that, ha that doesn't have English as her first language, she's actually, sign language is her first language. And we were able to bring this perspective to our product and make it much better and be able to create something that many, many people would enjoy and appreciate. When we did focus group testing, people said, this is the most un intuitive product I've ever used. And I truly believe, I've done a lot of focus group testing, I did a lot of the, that kind of work in Time Warner. I truly believe it was because of our, the makeup of our team, the way we thought about things, and how much we were willing to watch and listen to a, a broad group using our product. We would watch people read, we'd watch people interact with it. Very, very powerful. So what are some strategies that you can take away from this? And I would say, look for the people behind the title. We often get caught up in um, who someone is and, and, and what their business card says. Can you look for similarities between them and you versus differences? I'm a huge fan of having a meal. I noticed that the teams that I actually ate lunch with on a regular basis, we were much more productive as a team. And I don't mean the lunch where you, you bring in some food and you sit around the conference room and you have a meeting. I'm talking about real lunch, <laughs> ideally with chocolate. Um, so consider having, you know, having a meal and, and engaging with people in a more informal way. And remember that bi-directional encouragement is helpful. The people that work for you or the people that you work for, they can use a thank you, they can use encouragement. That helps bring the team together and you can see them as real people. So here's the last of the six things I wish I'd known before that optimism is much greater than fear. How many people believe that or have experienced it in their lives? Yeah. I think my former self taught me this one, actually. When I, I can remember being at Disney and they would bring these projects to us like, I want the ceiling to fall every 45 seconds and rebuild again. And we'd say, yes, we can do that. <laughs> and then go off and, have it, and figure it out. Investors want to talk to optimistic engineers. People want to buy from optimistic salespeople. Our products are developed because we have some excitement and some optimism around what we think we can accomplish. It's, it's just a truth. It's just an opportunity that if when you have that optimistic mindset, things happen. You can move mountains. And we have. This is what I think optimism feels like. I, I get up every day and I think about how can I be the most optimistic and positive person I can be. And it is truly, as I said before with, with Disney, when they said, we want you to make a dragon that will wake up and, and, and breathe fire, um, that's exciting to, to, to think about, but it's also hard to figure out how to do that. But it wasn't, it's that saying yes, it's saying yes to clients and saying yes to opportunities that give you that mindset. So what are some things that you can do to bring optimism into your business life? One thing I would say is investigate what's the cultural norm around optimism versus negativity. Is there something that, is there an understood, and you know, we kind of prefer people to be in one mode or another? And if it's not the way you'd like it to be, can you challenge that? I highly recommend taking a vitamin D break and going outside, again, changing your environment. Um, celebrate the small successes. This is really, really key. Just finding one small thing to be excited about 
and can have that snowball effect. Saying thank you, and also building a community of other like-minded individuals, those that want to have that optimistic mindset and are willing to say yes and figure it out. So here are the six things um, in a nice list for you, in no, but it's not in a specific order as I mentioned before. And here's another way I like to think about um, putting them all together. When you get to know people that you don't know, you will realize that no one is perfect and that people learn the most from their biggest mistakes. Challenging business norms, um, business as usual norms, makes room for freestyle sprints, which can actually create an entirely new product. And, and you can also save the sand in your hourglass by challenging those business norms. Please don't waste time on unconscious bias. They can lead to a huge lack of productivity and not meeting the needs and goals of your product and your team. And being optimistic in the workplace can make even the hardest tasks possible. Now, this is a lot. We've talked about six different things. We've also talked about, I don't know, 18 or 20 strategies for, for making these things happen. And that can be daunting to think about what are the next steps? What are you going to do when you leave here? What are you going to do tomorrow to take some of these, these learnings away? And I will say take just one small step. It's amazing what you can do in terms of making subtle changes that have a huge impact later on. And I'm currently reading a book called Being Bad First. It's by Erica Anderson. And she talks about taking that risk and knowing that you won't be good at something at first, but, will, but being willing to put yourself in that place and improve over time. I'm curious, how many of you noticed that the slides got progressively lighter through the presentation? I bet no one did, right? I changed the opacity of the background very slightly each time. But in only six slides, look at the dramatic effect. We went from a deep midnight blue to white with just an incremental change over time. So it's those subtle changes that can create such sharp results in your life, in your business, for your product, for your customers. It doesn't take much. So back to the shaking hands. It all starts with connections to individuals and how you present yourself and whether you're giving that handshake that me, that's, I'm shaking like I mean it, I'm excited to meet you, you're, you're more important than a phone, I'm not, gonna drop, I'm not gonna drop that. That's where all of this begins. It starts with knowing some, meeting someone that you don't know and just shaking their hands. That's all I have today. I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. I've created um, a page dip that's at dreamforce.pagedip.com, six things that share some of the components from this presentation, some visuals, and also some of the data that I shared about um, those different articles. And you can reach me on LinkedIn. I will tell you, however, that I don't accept LinkedIn uh, connections from people who I have not shook hands with or shared a meal. So. If you want to come up and talk afterwards, I would welcome you to meet, to meet each and every one of you. But we have some time for questions. If I can help out in any way, I'd love to. But I'll, I can talk loud, so that's fine. Ah, there it I goes. I can hear you. Um, I, th I thought that was great. Um, one of the things that I find challenging to balance and would be interested in your feedback on is the optimistic viewpoint versus people who sometimes say yes no matter what, but then yes. you don't have a real sense of practicality and, and how to make things happen because I tend on the other side the practicality and can go into negativity. So yes. how do you make that balance? That's a great question. I'm glad you brought that up, because I actually meant, uh, should have shared that I'm not talking about optimistic, optimism in the face of you know, not being practical or not weighing the options. I am an engineer, after all. I can't you know, look at something and not see that there's potential problems. But I think it is your viewpoint of what do you start with. You know, when, I, when I go to one of the developers that used to work with me at Time Warner, there was one person who was brilliant and no matter what we came forward with, he would say, he'd tell me all the reasons that we couldn't do it, or all the reasons why it was gonna be a problem. There was another developer who we'd go to, and he would always say, yes, and. 
we wanted to work with this person, but we had to bring the other, you know, this, the other guy to the table because he was, he was brilliant. So actually talking about that, because you're saying yes and you're optimistic does not mean that you're unrealistic or that you don't understand what the challenges are. But having that yes and mindset and saying just for a moment, let's talk about what's possible, how we can get there, what the benefits are, and then we will definitely have time to, to have people raise their concerns. But what if you talk about the optimistic areas and the, the uh, direction that you're going first and bring those concerns second? Even that slight change in order um, has a huge impact on how people start to think about what's possible and how they're gonna tackle the problem. Was that helpful? Yes. Great. Other questions? Sure. Thank you so much. So just a quick question regarding the freestyle. Mm -hmm. Can you go into a little bit more detail about just what that entails, yes. please? I love Thank you. freestyle. When we there can be dancing, oh my gosh. We actually have, this is a funny story. We have this little, um, I don't know what you call it. It's a, it's a dancing guy. It's a little mechanical dancing guy that I found. And because I'm a Disney geek and we used to do audio animatronic figures, I thought it was hysterical. So whenever we have something that goes well, we bring out dancing guy and he does this little, um, little thing. So dancing guy is actually a part of our freestyle sprint. But freestyle sprints, um, we talked about what were some problems that we were trying to solve and also giving people an, a, a time to think about things that were just of interest to them. So for example, one of our developers said it would be really interesting to bring uh, geolocation aware binks to page dips and being able to provide some information to people that were, that were related to where they were um, you know, physically. I was in London once, I remember I was reading a book, and uh, they mentioned the Rosetta Stone, which I've always been fascinated by. And it turned out that the Rosetta Stone was in a museum that was within walking distance from our hotel. And if I hadn't been, happened to be reading that book, and happened to be reading that section of that book at that time, we would, my family would not have gone to go see the Rosetta Stone, which is really cool, but much smaller than you'd think. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and it would have been disappointing to have figured that out when we were on our plane back to, to Colorado. So it's an example of, one of the people said, I want to try, I want to experiment with geolocation, and there were no expectations. We said, go for it, see what you can do. Um, so a lot of it is feeding people's own creativity and ideas that they have. Um, sometimes it's around a product or a feature that uh, a customer is interested in. But often it's really what's, what's drawing you? What does your intuition say would be something interesting to explore or learn more about? And there's a space to go create that without any expectations. And then at the end of that time frame, we, can, we go through, we talk about the pros and cons of what the experience was like. And so often we'll pick one of those to move forward with um, or at least put on our backlog of things that we want to investigate further. So it's, it can be very open-ended in that creative sense, but it is absolutely time-bound, time and doing the retrospective is, is absolutely critical. Any other questions you have about that? Or is that... Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned the standing uh, uh, meetings. Do you also have standing meetings with your customers, or I mean, I've just I've just missed the first ten minutes. So uh, yeah. So all all the meetings, I'm not the all, all all of those, but you have a lot of meetings just standing up and talking like that. We have a lot of meetings standing up. We are doing the standing desk thing right now too. I don't know. A lot of our clients are remote, so we are working with them, you know, over Skype or or remotely. When I go and do you know, presentations with, say, Gallup, we tend to have traditional sit-down meetings. So I would say for those discussions that are an hour or less, we always stand up internally. But I, don't, I can't think of an example where we've actually had a standing meeting or imposed that culture on our clients themselves. But I might try that and get back to you. But I think if, there's one in particular I think they would, they would kind of be interested in going for that. It's a good idea. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. One of, one of the points that I found most interesting was around the time component. Many of us work in very large organizations that train us to live 30 minutes at a time, and sometimes 30 minutes times two at the same time. I know. So one, one thing I would ask, ask you is, if you had the opportunity to go back to your former self and bring one thing back around time, what do you think it would be and how do you think it would be received? 
I actually would imp impose passing periods because I was so frustrated that I would have, like you said, more than one meeting in one time slot, let alone an opportunity to go to the restroom or get something to eat or get a glass of water. So you leave, you're, you're dehydrated, <laughs> you know, you're exhausted because there's just no time to, to land where you need to be and, and sit there or stand there and, and get ready. It was, it's mind boggling that because our schedule, a lot, there should be something in the calendar, and I should, you know, Google, answer this, that, you can't put a meeting right next to another meeting. You can't time travel. So why do we have a, a, a technology that doesn't acknowledge that? It's absurd. So if I could, I would go back and just give people even three minutes to go from one place to another. I think it would change the world. Good question, thank you. Yes. Thanks again for everything. Um, one of the challenges that I have in the company that I'm at right, right now is that it's uh, global and uh, we work remotely every day. Yes. Um, one of the challenges that I run into constantly is miscommunication. So what I wanted to ask you is how can you prevent that miscommunication that happens when you are digitally communicating with each other? That's an interesting question. And it's actually one of the reasons that I think our product is doing very well is because we, we give people other ways to, to bring media and text together and communicate. We don't all learn best by reading or listening um, or doing. So I think that's one, of, one, one option. To be able to share in multiple ways is very helpful. Um, but also giving people, like there's this idea of pausing. When you share something and you listen for that acknowledgement, whether it's through email or whether it's when you're on the phone, we can be so caught up in our own agenda that we don't recognize where someone maybe has lost the path and 30 minutes have gone by or 47 minutes have gone by and they're still stuck in this place where they're, they're, they're not with you. And so by making sure that you're bringing them along the way and, and providing a culture where it's okay to ask questions or you pause, that you actively ask for that, that you reward people for taking that risk. Particularly if there's language issues and time issues, it's hard for people to admit that maybe I don't, I don't, I don't get it or I have a not so high level question and making it okay for them to do that I think can make a very big difference. Great question, thanks. You're awesome, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, you've obviously worked with large teams. We're yes. currently a very small team. How do you make sure that everybody is engaged and the morale stays high on a small ship, so to speak, so that nobody wants to jump ship? Um, did you go to Anthony Robbins thing last night? A lot of clapping, I hugged like 15 people in 20 <laughs> seconds, I was all over it. I am not a hugger normally, and I'm, I'm, I'm like hugging strangers. I'm running to hug strangers, it was, it, was, it was interesting. But you know, he talked a lot about engaging, and it has been so interesting to me to go from leading you know, 100 developers or more to having a team of less than 20 people, um, and being able to communicate with them and be, you know, kind of be in that same space every day has a very different you know, motivational um, uh, contingency. But I think there's another book that I love called First Break All the Rules. And it talks about how do you engage and draw people's talents. Um, it, the idea is you can't put more into people, but you can draw out their talents. And I think when people are really engaged, it's when, when their managers or when their peers appreciate their uniqueness and they draw those things out and they call upon them to do things that they do well and encourage them to su succeed in that area. I think engagement really drops off when you're, put, you're pushing people in a direction that's not comfortable for them without support and not recognizing what they're good at. So that's, that's been my experience and, and being able to put people in different roles and being open to that, it's not a failure. It's we're going to help align your talents with what we need to have happen. And the, the, when people like what they do and it's moving the company forward, the product forward and making clients happy, then there's this, there's this extra energy that comes out of that combination that's almost like a chemical reaction. So I think that's about all we have time for. Right. Right. But I just want to share that um, this is the best 40 minutes of my week so far. Thank you. I learned a lot. Thank all of you. And go, go shake hands with, with some fierce determination to meet new people. That's my.
parting thought. Have a great day. Thank you.